but this is our May Churches Against Trafficking meeting. And we have been online doing our meetings in this format since um, early 2020. And as we polled folks, uh, even though we love being in person, we have found that more people were available uh, by coming to the Zoom format. So even though I know most of us are a little Zoom fatigued, I don't know about your life, mine is definitely settling down with fewer Zoom meetings, but there is something really convenient and wonderful about being able to gather, especially when we can gather from all, all around the country, um, which is really exciting to see some friends from the East Coast um, all the way to the West Coast. So welcome this evening. My name is Kim Barry Jones, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Reconciliation at Point Loma Nazarene University. And Churches Against Trafficking is an initiative of the center and something that we are proud to partner with our community partners and church partners to help educate, empower, and activate the church community. And so really excited for what's in store for us tonight. We'll tell you more about our speaker in a minute. But before we do that, I'm really thrilled to introduce you this evening to Riley Shore Kern. Riley is our program director of community relations. She joined the team in January and I couldn't be happier to have her on the team. I have to admit it's been a secret um, ambition of mine for many years. I first met Riley almost a decade ago when she was a student at the university and when I first got involved at the center and got to know her and was impressed with her then and have watched her um, go out into the world and, and have a career and was able to convince her to come back our way. So really thrilled to have Riley who is in charge of the Churches Against Trafficking Initiative along with all of our other community relations work. So she has a full plate, but really thrilled to uh, invite and introduce her to you this evening. Hi friends, and thank you, Kim, for the welcome. It's been an honor to be part of the CJR team already, and I see some familiar faces. So I met a few of you and look forward to meeting the rest who I haven't had a chance to meet yet. Um, but I just have a couple announcements to share with you this evening. Um, we have our stolen documentary showing at the Rock Church on August 4th. So if you wanna put that on your calendar, it will be at 6.30. Um, we are hosting it live, so if you want to come out to The Rock and see it in person, we'll be watching the documentary for about an hour, 15 minutes, and then we'll have a live panel of experts following the documentary, and it will be moderated by NBC7's um, spokesperson, Monica Dean. Um, and if you're not familiar with the documentary, it is focused on sex trafficking of children in San Diego. If you can't make it out in person, it's also going to be available on Zoom, and we'll be sharing that Zoom link as we're closer to the event, so we'll make sure you have that as well. For our men in the audience, we also have a resource we wanted to share with you or just another opportunity. Um, it'll be hosted by the Human Trafficking Faith Coalition, but they're hosting a workshop on May 21st at 8 a.m. And it's called Disrupting Demand Through Strategic Intervention. So it's specifically just a workshop for men in this fight to end human trafficking. So I'll pop the link to that workshop in the chat if that's something that interests you. Um, but now I'm gonna pass it back to Kim so she can introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Riley. I just could not be more excited to uh, bring Dr. Sandra Morgan to our Churches Against Trafficking meeting. It's great timing because she has a new book that's just come out. And um, I spoke to her, I think in the fall about coming to a meeting and we felt like this would be just the perfect time. But um, Dr. Morgan has been a trailblazer in this work since honestly, before most of us were even thinking about it. And she is not only recognized regionally um, and statewide and nationally, but actually globally for her expertise uh, in combating human trafficking and working to end violence against women and children. And Sandy serves um, on the faculty of Vanguard University and also as the director of the Global Center for Women and Justice. Her bio is long and lengthy. We've shared it with you multiple times, so I'm not gonna read it to anymore tonight because I really want to spend the rest of our meeting hearing from Dr. Morgan and hearing about her book and her resources to help churches. That is our goal at Churches Against Trafficking is to not only increase awareness, but really primarily to empower and equip the church to uh, find their unique place in this work, knowing that all of us can play a role. So Sandy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we're, we're just thrilled to hear from you. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I've always loved the Churches Against Trafficking model. Um, a lot of task forces are really trying to be really, really careful. And so it's always using um, the public square terminology of faith-based and I'm comfortable there too, but my background is ministry. My husband's a pastor. I'm ordained in the Assemblies of God. And so it's really good to be with um, your community. I want to take just a moment and ask Kim Yim to unmute and um, turn on her camera. Kim, um, uh, the book is actually co-authored by myself. And how do I get, get it to focus? It goes, oh, I have the other, but you've all seen pictures of the book already. <clears throat> Ending Human Trafficking, A Handbook of Strategies for the Church Today. And um, Kim and I have been working together for a long time. And she originally wrote um, Refuse to Do Nothing. So this is Kim Yim, my co-author partner. And Sh Shane Moore isn't here. So thanks for being here, Kim. Thanks. Thanks for introducing. I'll let you, I'll let you do your thing. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna rush through a lot, and I am using. I love the fact that we have the book now to use as as a um, a guide, a structure for some of the most important principles of being salt and light in your community and anti human trafficking. So to start with, Riley is going to do a poll for us. And there are four questions, so um, we'll give you a couple minutes to answer them all. You need elevator music or something. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> and I'm not the person to provide that, but uh, while you're while you're filling this out and answering these, I will tell you this has been quite a week. Our um, our guest, our host from um, for our study abroad, which is technically not abroad, but it is on the Navajo Nation. Next week, we were invited by the First Lady of the Navajo Nation, and her mother passed away on Mother's Day. So um, it's been really a challenging time. And then here at the center, one of our patrons for a decade, her beautiful home was um, a casualty of the weird fire yesterday in Laguna Niguel, if you guys heard about that, and burned to the ground. Um, and she hosted so many events. She's safe, her husband is safe, but those are big challenges to, uh, in our communities. Okay. And then scrolling down, I'm going to kind of look and see how we're doing on um, answering all these questions. See, it's I don't have enough grading to do. So I had to have another test. If you guys are ready, shall we end the poll? Okay. And let's look at the results. And Riley, you're running that part, right? Yes, can you see them okay? It says it's sharing. Are you able to see those? It, yeah. Oh, okay. You have to scroll down to see all of it, all the questions, but yes. Okay, so we have um, 11 participants from the group here, and um, one person is a guest, and three are part of a San Diego church, but it's their first meeting, so kudos to you for coming, <clears throat> and then we've got, um, I love the knowing how long people have been part of a community, so I think it's really great to have people who have been here a long time and brand new people because we have so much work to do. 
Um, and then looking at the areas that your churches are involved in, awareness event planning is a very common theme for churches. I think the church can do a lot more. And I love seeing the prevention perspective here and the support for victims. And I can't wait to find out who's doing outreach to migrant workers. Um, does anybody, whoever said that, do you wanna like raise your hand? Ah, John, okay, that's great. I am, um, I'm convinced that we are neglecting labor trafficking and a lot of people um, can benefit if we begin to look at that. And then the last question, I didn't know if because of the bio, if anybody had already picked up a copy of Ending Human Trafficking, but that is not the case. So um, I'll, I won't, um, I won't be shy about telling you about what it what it looks like and things like that. So, all right, I'm going to stop the poll. Oh, did you share the results, Riley? That just popped up. Yeah, I shared them and now I took them away. So it sh you should be good to go. Okay, mine, um, mine still sh shows the other. So I'm like, okay, so I can, I can now do my share, right? Okay, we will see. For some reason, the poll doesn't go away for me. So that was my problem. All right, so let us start right here and share my PowerPoint. And I'm gonna watch my clock so I stay on track. Everybody can see the slides now? Just nod, it keeps, keeps me going. So one of the things I taught a seven o'clock in the morning, three day a week, New Testament survey class, freshman during COVID. And I learned that yes, everybody has to mute, but don't turn your cameras off because that's what feeds my soul so I can see your faces, <clears throat> have that interaction. So if it's at all possible to have your, your cameras on, that's just wonderful for me um, to not be speaking to black boxes. Although when the students came back, I did have this idea that we should make little black frames with their names in white letters and they could hold them in their seats. So I would recognize them because when they came back, they had to wear masks. So either way, it was complicated. <laughs> so I am I am the director of the Global Center for Women and Justice here at Vanguard University. And my love for educating the, um, the community is only surpassed by my love for the students. And I really, um, I'm, that's not an overstatement at all for me. Okay, did you just get my, um, my PowerPoint Yep, I put it in the wrong place. So I'm having a little challenge and I'm gonna give myself some um, grace on this because, we could, okay. We could see your PowerPoint before just now, just. It just went away. Okay, yeah, let me try can... again. All right, I have to stop my share. I'm so sorry, people. This is not the way it's supposed to go, but nevertheless, um, we will persevere. So now Riley, I'm thinking I should have had you run this so then I wouldn't worry about this, okay. but I don't, but I'm good now. So, okay. So I'm going to, um, we did the poll and here's a cover picture of the authors and the book and here's the part and this is um, something you can you can do online later um, but there is a code for 30 percent off if you order it at InterVarsity press 
it has, they've printed like three times now, but they don't print huge amounts like 1500 or a thousand. So it's back ordered until the first of June, but you can still use a 30% off code for a Kindle version. That's the end of my advertisement. So when I worked in um, the public private partnership advisory council um, in Washington, DC, I worked a lot with ambassador John Cotton Richmond. I had worked with him before when he was at um, the Human Trafficking Institute, met him first years ago when he was a Department of Justice prosecutor. So I asked him to write the foreword. And this is the thing that people often don't get out in the public square, how important and valuable churches are in this battle. So he observed as a leader, as an attorney, churches have a unique and special role to play in the larger anti-human trafficking movement. There's a great deal of talent within the church. If properly trained and equipped, followers of Jesus stand poised to make a huge impact for good. The church possesses some distinctives that governments do not. Followers of Jesus operate without boundaries. They do not have jurisdictional borders or areas of responsibility. They can serve wherever the need exists. Faith communities do not operate on a two-year or four-year grant. Short-term thinking is the tainted fruit of bureaucracies. In contrast, some faith communities can think longer term and work through far more flexible funding sources that do not inhibit impact. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has seen a grant end and the resources to a survivor go with it. A project reaching out into the community ends, but the church is faithful and keeps showing up. So that's why I feel really compelled to equip the church with the best possible tools. The book is laid out in eight chapters. The first chapter is to make sure you understand the language, you know the elements, what is human trafficking. And I know this group already. Um, and so most of you have a pretty good handle on that. So I'm not gonna spend time there. I, I want you to think about how you apply the lessons learned. And we created a little tool at the end of each chapter to help you um, make a plan to build a safety fence. And you ask, why build a safety fence? Well, when we think about victims falling into human trafficking, you can imagine a cliff. And at the bottom of the cliff, there are ambulances and people waiting to take you to the hospital when you fall off the cliff. So wouldn't it be smarter to build a safety fence so no one falls off. So at the end of this presentation, I wanna take some time to think about how we become part of building a safety fence right in our own community. It may look more glamorous to be driving the ambulance, to doing the rescues, but the church is more sustainable and uniquely suited to do the prevention to build a safety fence. So one of the things I discovered early on is often in the church, we don't know the right language. So I encourage you to learn the language used in the public sector. And here in the United States and globally, we do for the most part, either through the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or the Palermo Protocol, follow a model of prevention, protection, prosecution. We added partnership, which should be where we start. And then later, um, several years ago in a presentation at the UN, policy began to pop up on this model. And so my, um, um, I see someone waiting and I'm a teacher, so I have to let them in. And, and so this is the 
the basic guideline for teaching that this is a, an enhanced collaborative model. That means we actually have metrics for measuring how well we partner, collaboration. And we have a victim-centered, trauma-informed approach. Probably in my days as a task force administrator, the churches were the most difficult for me to work with, even though I'm one of them, because they didn't have victim-centered, trauma-informed training. And they would ask questions that seemed a little uh, forward. And so trauma-informed teaching for your volunteers is really important to be part of um, a partnership. Always, though, understanding that the big goal is people over programs and people over process. Oops, I clicked too fast. The second chapter, and I really have to give kudos to my co-author Kim Yim here, the past and present, understanding the history of slavery, and really even thinking about where history of slavery shows up in our Bible and in our Christian literature. We're not going to do the history today, though, because I want to work on a couple of very pragmatic um, understandings around prevention, building those safety fences. Prevention is about increasing safety for the most vulnerable. So who are the most vulnerable? Who are the most vulnerable? Well, a lot of research has been done and some of you are right there in San Diego. Somebody else is back East. Um, I do a lot of international travel. So I found that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals helped me quickly identify the most vulnerable and begin to look at what that looks like in my own community and use this as a guide. Is poverty an issue in my own community? Is hunger an issue? And we have a great deal of um, food scarcity issues in during COVID and now with um, other challenges as we emerge from COVID. And health and well being, education, gender equality, um, clean water. There are villages globally where the reason that a girl doesn't get an education is not because her parents won't let her go to school, but because. Her part in the household is to go and get the water, and that takes half of a, the day. And so making access to clean water becomes a way to give girls education. And when girls get education, we begin to see less trafficking of girls in those areas. Um, I also want to emphasize on the sustainable development goals that peace, justice, and strong institutions, number 16. This is a place where the church and rule of law in our criminal justice systems, we can be advocates for um, rule of law and justice, and the church can be really a partner in that. So prevention. The most important P when the Palermo Protocol was passed, when the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed in 2000. And yet, when I began to research how much we were spending on prevention, it kind of looked like reading a triple A guide on restaurants and hotels. Um, the really expensive ones had $4 signs. <clears throat> prosecution has four dollar signs investigation taking it to court the jury the judge the prosecutor the public defender tens of thousands of dollars in simple cases and six figures in more complicated so prevention has very little funding aimed at it but when you go back 
and read the story in Second Kings, you see a marvelous model of prevention that I want to um, suggest that every church can be part of. So in Second Kings chapter four, verses one through seven, you see the very first biblical example of prevention. In that story, the widow comes to the prophet Elisha and says, my husband has died and the creditors are coming to take my two sons as slaves. Well, we still see that scenario in human trafficking. We have labor trafficking victims here in California that are paying off a debt and children are often used to pay that debt and are in debt bondage. Here in Orange County, our very first trafficking victim that was identified was a 12 year old girl who had been sold by her parents to pay a debt. And then she became a household slave here. So when I think about how we often respond to these kinds of atrocities, um, we would probably say, well, sit down and tell us your story. We take notes. We might even put together a little video storyboard for church on Sunday, play music to it, maybe send somebody out to get some pictures of the kids and then take up an offering. And I know some of you are already cringing because no, we don't, we don't, we know we don't want to do that. We want to do things that are more sustainable. So the interesting thing is Elisha immediately asked her what she had. And she said she had a flask of olive oil. Now that flask, I took that picture in Greece. I lived there for 10 years and that flask would sit in my hand and I have small hands um, would sit in my hand and it would just be enough oil to put in my lamp to get home at night if I ran out of oil. And so she sort of was like, I don't have much, but he told her to go out into the community and gather empty vessels so he didn't ask her to go and ask people for valuable things, but for empty vessels. And that meant that they engaged the whole community, family, friends, neighbors. And this is based on um, a well-researched evidence-based approach called asset-based community development. So I'm thinking Elisha had a master's degree or something or the equivalent at that time, because he started where she was with what she had, what her ability was, and he engaged the whole community in some kind of activity that would develop into something else. And the, uh, prop, the, the principles in this, we should have done this in the morning, you guys. Okay. Uh, Community assets in the faith community include things like being trusted, having a history, not just a grant two-year history, but your church, how long has it been in that community? You're established and you have existing facilities that we have used um, here in Orange County and in lots of other places, and I'm sure you have due to host the actual opportunities to engage in the community. So faith community assets, actually, um, I think it's not like, well, we can decide if we're going to get involved or not. I actually think we are mandated to because in Proverbs 31, eight, it tells us to be a voice for those who have no voice. And then it's a semicolon. The rest of the sentence is, is action, ensure justice for those being crushed, the migrant, the victim of violence, those living in poverty, discrimination, people, um, refugees who are here because of conflict and war in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Ukraine, 
And before, and again, this is about prevention for those being crushed, don't wait till they're at the bottom of the cliff with broken bones and literally crushed. So in the asset-based community development model, we want to use our facilities and our opportunity to educate, to do prevention, um, build empathy, use our Sunday homilies, our catechism, our Sunday schools, our youth groups, our women's groups, our men's groups, our classrooms, and engage in the community. And when, um, when the, the widow and her sons collected all that olive oil, I mean, all those, those vessels, she started pouring from her, her little flask and filled every one of those vessels. And now she is an olive oil entrepreneur. She has a way to pay her bills. And in that culture at that time for a widow, becoming a businesswoman was a viable way for her to survive. So when we think about prevention, um, we don't wanna just use a model that says, well, are there kids out there being trafficked because of a family debt? Um, we have to actually look at what does prevention look like? And I was, I was talking today to Catherine Chan, who is the Health and Human Services Office on Trafficking in Persons Director. Prevention is her thing. She loves it. She's passionate. They are producing a lot of resources. And I think it's really important for us to learn to use the tools that are common and already vetted and approved for the public sector as um, tools that we use. So I encourage you to go to the OTIP website and I can um, send Kim some links for you. But <clears throat> some basics to understand how to do prevention right where you are. The first principle is to predict what is going to happen. So look at this little girl. Somebody um, want to tell me what's going to happen if she eats that whole candy sucker? She'll be sick. She'll be sick. And what's going to happen to her teeth? Cavities. Cavities. And I've, I've started doing a lot of things with young moms. And it's just so important for them to understand that when they are so focused on protecting their children's teeth, that... and they start brushing their teeth as soon as the first one pops out. So when you predict that something's going to happen, you have to devise a way to protect. And that's why in school every single year, the kids get a fresh toothbrush. I hope they get more than the one, but they get a new toothbrush and they do the little chew up the tablet with the black light to see how well they are protecting their teeth by brushing their teeth. Now, the next question is how often do they need to brush their teeth to prevent cavities? Anybody? Three times a day. Three times a day? Oh my goodness. The state of California says that we can do, we can prevent child sex trafficking by offering prevention curriculum once in middle school and once in high school. But you're absolutely right. For real prevention, it has to be practiced over and over and over again from the time they're very small. And, and how many of you quit brushing your teeth when you reached 18? Nobody, I don't see any hands. So this is some prevention is ongoing. And the name of our book, Ending Human Trafficking, it's really, we use that progressive um, sense that this is a process and we all get to be part of prevention in our communities. So now let's take that same principle of predict, protect and practice 
to the horrendous numbers that are increasing because of online um, solicitation of sexual abuse images, pornography. Here's a child with an electronic device, whether it's an, um, a tablet, a phone, or a, or a computer. And they not only have access to all kinds of things that are maybe they need for homework, but other people have access to them. So we can predict that they will be approached by someone who has ill intentions. So then we have to devise a way to protect them. Well, one of the easiest ways is to use resources that are already vetted and do them in our churches, in our Sunday school, um, Miss National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, is a public partner, public private partnership with the FBI. So the content in their curriculum is always being updated and it's age appropriate from three years old with a little clicky all the way up to high school kids. And it is also um, broken out into meeting curriculum guidelines for public schools. So you can recommend it to teachers. One church that I worked with had kind of outgrown their community and hadn't changed. And I'm sure some of you have been in similar circumstances. So the church didn't really look like the neighborhood anymore. It was mostly senior citizens, but they really cared about the children. And there was a middle school two blocks from the church. So they decided to use their beautiful Sunday school classrooms for an after school cyber safety training. They recruited teachers. Um, some of the people in the church knew how to do this on the computer and they had a summer program. The community started calling that the church that cares about our kids because most of the people in the community didn't have access to those resources at that time. So prevention, you're going to, I'm gonna go back in my slides for reminders. You're going to predict what might happen. Kids going to the mall and learning about friendship. Online, um, social media, how do we predict? And then designing a plan to protect, but not just once a year, not once um, in middle school, but every single day. And that takes partnership with parents, with caregivers, grandparents can be really active, um, child care providers, as well as the school, but it's not all in just one place. Okay, the fourth chapter is about protection. That's where we see identifying, reporting, and aftercare. And um, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of this that usually we're not entirely suited to do. So we have to learn what the requirements are. One of the most challenging experiences that I had as a task, federal task force administrator was when a lady in the church called and wanted me to send child victims to the home where she and another volunteer from the church were going to open it as a, to take care of child victims of sex trafficking. And when I explained why I couldn't do it and all of the rules and the laws and the best practice for social workers and everything, um, she accused me of persecution. And I did not say no because she was a member of a church. I said no, because my hands were tied. This was under, I was, my employment was under a federal grant. And so I think we have to stop and think about how we engage in protection and do what we can to be supportive of those who are the social workers and the case managers. Volunteer to be the person who drives 
victims to DMV and waits with them to get their IDs. That's, that's a big job. And it's something a volunteer who has gone through trauma-informed training and confidentiality training can become part of the support for the protection piece. Um, I also think that we have great opportunity to work with the refugee and the immigrant. And it's important for us to understand the difference, especially today when there's a lot of polarization in, in conversations around this. And I just had this conversation with people around dinner on Mother's Day that didn't understand the difference between an immigrant and a refugee. And when someone is forced to flee their home um, due to war and persecution and violence, um, we can build a lot more empathy for those folks. An immigrant who chooses to resettle always has dreams and hopes, and we can be supportive as well because they become very vulnerable to fraud and coercion then because they think they got a job with a visa. And I can't spend much time on that, but think about that. Also know how to report through the National Human Trafficking Hotline number, using a text, calling National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I often get messages from people who have heard me present, and that happened again last week. It's like, what am I supposed to do? And it's, so I'm texting back the cyber tip line is a great way when you see that there are kids in your community um, getting messages that are inappropriate. Always know your local um, resources as well, CPS and law enforcement. My time, I've got an exercise for us to do. So I got to speed up this last couple of slides. Chapter five, prosecution, people in places of power, the people in the church, um, their role in prosecution is not to go and do rescues themselves and find the perpetrators, but they're to support the people with that power. And most churches don't have the resources to do the fourth P. And the idea around prevention not getting a lot of resources, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a good decision to focus our resources on prevention. The fifth P is, or the six, chapter six is about partnership. And I have a couple little illustrations to help you imagine what partnership might look like. Because we often come to the table and we say, well, here's what we've got. We wrote this curriculum and we want you to use it. Or one lady called me and said, I have two cases of shampoo. And I'm thinking, oh, we could put them in the backpacks until I found out they were 64 ounce, half gallon jugs. Um, and I had a small office. I had no way to keep them. Um, so I recommend that you find out what the need is and then the definition of partnership in the 2010, I think, TIP report, it was really characterized by expertise and resources. Look at the need and then see what expertise do you have? What resources do you have? And at, here at Vanguard, I did that. I have, um, I saw the task force said we need community engagement. Well, we have expertise in conference planning and we have facilities and volunteers and students. So we put um, community engagement as one of our top priorities in supporting our local human trafficking task force. <clears throat> Chapter seven, this is so important. Churches need to have policies. Policies create process and develop patterns of ethical practices to build trust and operationalize value for human dignity. <coughs> policies protect the church, 
in the nonprofit when people color outside the lines and it comes back on your mission, your institution. We have it written down. We have a policy for insurance. You have to have a child abuse policy. That's the law in California. How do you institute that? But we can go beyond just sexual abuse policies, which sometimes churches have not always enforced. <coughs> We can also have policies about using our procurement funds, our, our, what we buy all our supplies with, so that we are intentionally building empathy with our kids, teaching them that some of the products on the shelves in our grocery store are being produced by children who do not get an education. And this is, this is such a great tool. It has over a thousand pages of research. It gets updated by our Department of Labor and it teaches empathy as kids and adults learn that my choices impact a child on another continent, building partnership. <coughs> Chapter eight, again, my um, colleague, Kim, wrote several beautiful prayers that um, walk you through the five P's and then adds the sixth P of prayer. And this prayer is not from that chapter, but it motivates me all the time to keep doing what I do to equip and educate the church. Um, in Ambassador Richmond's foreword, he says, a survivor of human trafficking once told me that the only thing her trafficker could not control was her ability to pray. She prayed to God for her pain to end. She prayed that people would do more than be informed and more than merely have distant compassion. She prayed that people would take smart strategic action that would restore her freedom and allow her to thrive beyond her trauma. You are the answer to her prayer. And like this Pithati, it's a Greek um, jug from the island of Crete that's, I could stand up inside of it and they would have to carry it down steep stairs 3,000 years ago. It had handles baked into it all over. So everyone could carry this issue forward. And we have resources for you. Uh, the book is a great guide. Um, it's built off of a lot of the content from the Ending Human Trafficking podcast that we've been doing for 11 years here. And there are especially, um, you can go to endinghumantrafficking.org and search for toolkits for community leadership for faith-based community content. And I love education here at Vanguard and engaging just like those, just like those empty jugs. Um, social media is a blessing and a curse, but I do believe that we can gather our community, our friends, our families, and help them join us in building a safety fence. <clears throat> so I want to um, hear from you. We're going to give you three minutes. That's not very long. Um, and I want you to think about how you contribute to building safety fences in your community. And we're gonna just give you three minutes. There's three people in a group and then we'll come back. And as you come back, start writing in the chat. So Riley, will you send us to our breakout rooms? Yes, all right, here we go. So I'm gonna send you, you have to join it. So you'll get a little prompt on your screen and go ahead and join your breakout rooms, all right? Here we go.
I think we ended up. I'm unmuting. So start writing in your chat. Um, what are the fence posts that your church, what did you determine? You're already building those safety fences or you could. I, um, I did a project once where we went around the neighborhood and um, checked in to see how families were, and especially single moms. Um, single moms often are one car repair bill away from not being able to pay their rent. So, okay, Cheryl, I love this. Educate the congregation. Host journey out events in my local church. I love journey out. Um, my church already has a social worker one day a week and offers showers and a community refrigerator. I can't believe it, but I had never thought about talking to them about making sure they know about resources. Okay, so I love this. So all you have to do to tweak showers and community refrigerator is have a little information about the hotline and uh, making sure that they're and have safe resources. RBCPC is interested in educating the congregation, middle, high school students and families. And prevention to um, adolescents, best practice is peer to peer. So um, we've, got, we've got lots, Shadow Mountain Ministry to prisoners and families of prisoners. Christian education can support prevention, outreach to children in our community. Um, we're going to save this chat and who wrote it in there. And then in six months, we're going to ask you how you're doing on those things. Accountability, right? Now everybody's going to quit writing. The No More Prevention Program, um, Food Program. Uh, so I think even though we're small, we can actually be um, a catalyst for, for spreading opportunities to learn more and to invite people into this conversation. So I think I'm gonna share my screen again. Yes. And I want to show you um, some building fence things that I think you've already identified and a few that I might suggest you think about. Education, that's so you, churches are designed for education. And when people have knowledge um, and insight, Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says, with knowledge and insight, love abounds and discernment grows so that, um, what we do reflects well on the church, on Christ. And I think one of the things that um, grieved me the most was to see churches not doing things well because they didn't know any better. And then it reflected poorly on their churches. And I seriously was at a DOJ conference where they split our tables, um, task force and task force, and we had a lunch table talk. Have you ever done one of those exercises? Everybody has to answer the same question. And the question was, what is one of your biggest challenges? And the sergeant from Texas said, the wacko church people. And my whole table, my group, our five members at the table stopped and all looked at me. And finally, one of them was brave enough to say, she's one of them. And I said, yep, I can marry you and bury you. And so, um, but it, 
it was a place to begin the conversation and to begin to understand what I had experienced as a, as a task force administrator who I could see myself as kind of being bivocational. Others without my background just plain saw it as wacko and worse. So education. I think a very big missing component, and it came out in this chat, is the church assessment piece. The church assessment, what are you already doing? Showers and a community refrigerator. Oh my goodness, this is like a prevention strategy waiting to have a, a little bit of, of strength built into it. And it already exists. You don't have to design it. <clears throat> In one, um, one assessment that we did, we determined that the church wanted to do all kinds of good things, but they had no relationship with law enforcement. And you can do the prevention, you can do a little protection, but anything that has to do with a case, if you aren't able to work with law enforcement and judges and prosecutors and public defenders, um, there's a big piece missing. So uh, working on that with church assessment. Prevention, you identified uh, a couple of things, the education, working with the middle school kids. I really think that every church should have a NetSmart's clicky um, piece of every Sunday school lesson. I just think it's fabulous. There is a video after this is done. Well, after you get up and walk around anyway, um, go to the NetSmarts and look for the video called It's Okay to Tell. It's Okay to Tell. Will somebody write that in the chat? Um, it's like a seven minute video that's age appropriate for a seven or eight year old about what to do when something shows up on your screen, and that's what we know, um, Thorne's research on the intersection of puberty and the internet shows us kids are being exposed to this very early and they don't know what to do. The it's okay to tell is a, an age appropriate animated prevention video that gives them the tools and the language to respond when that happens and get help from an adult. Um, another building uh, safety net, community trust. How do we build community trust? We show up, we don't just want the limelight. We'll do the hard jobs like driving a victim to DMV. I don't wanna go to DMV, but they need an ID, they need those resources. Building collaboration, that's gonna be, uh, that takes time. It's not just going to a meeting every quarter, but it's showing up um, for the working groups and asking what your job is and then fulfilling it, being faithful in that. And I think the most significant um, change I would like people to do that have been doing anti-trafficking for a long time is to look at how you build policies at your church for staff, for volunteers, for people buying things that might be being made by um, state forced labor, Uyghur people in China. Um, and so I think the irony, I just think it's, it's just the irony is overwhelming that we will send thousands of dollars to our missionaries in another country and then purchase products made by the people they're trying to reach. And we're not trying to end that exploitation. So how do we bring some balance? And uh, lots of times our Live to Free Club um, works on teaching kids how to, how to buy fair trade chocolate, start simple and, and go up from there. So implement policies, that is a really important piece. And now I think we have, oh, yep, we end at 7.15. So we have 10 minutes for Q&A. And if you have any questions uh, for me, uh, for Kim, I really hope that you buy the book and do a, do a, a Bible study or a, 
um, a book club at your church and walk through and see if there's some of this that might apply in your community. There might be some lessons and some tools that you can use uh, right where you are. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Morgan, um, for your presentation. And I love that you gave us, well, helped us identify an action step coming out of this meeting. So I think that's so valuable. Um, we have one question already in the chat. And then if anyone else wants to pop questions in there, um, just kind of reflecting on anything that's been shared. If you have any anything that you've tried and just run into a challenge, we have Dr. Morgan with us for the next 10 minutes. So throw those questions in the chat and we'll get to them in just a minute. Um, but our first question was in response to the It's Okay to Tell video that you mentioned for children. Is there anything similar for teens that's an online resource that we could share with um, kids that are a little bit older? Oh, absolutely. The um, NetSmart's videos are every single age group. And there are videos that show um, scenarios of boys who have been recruited online. Um, there are videos that just teach, it's like brushing your teeth. One of my favorites is kind of old. It's called Two Kinds of Stupid. It's in English and in Spanish. And um, it's, you, you just have to watch it. It's funny. And the kid, the kid um, first of all, breaks contract on, he's an athlete at a high school and drinks and then um, takes pictures of it and posts it. So there's the storyline of two kinds of stupid. If you break the rules and then you post pictures, yes. And Kim um, um, mentioned in the chat, and I mentioned earlier, Thorn has uh, released um, Thorn for parents. I talked to the uh, VP that's in charge of that. And I said, please don't make it just for parents. I want it to be for grandparents and caregivers and the teachers because the kids who are the most vulnerable, probably their parents aren't um, really involved in their lives and have other issues. So it's like teaching kids to brush their teeth. The mom who started with the little finger toothbrush with her kids um, is going to keep doing that until I, the last thing she says the day they move out to go to college is, did you brush your teeth? Um, that's the that's the kind of thing we need as a community because there are kids and I've I've seen a child who didn't have one tooth without a cavity when she saw a dentist for the first time in a child welfare program because mom and dad were on drugs and alcohol and nobody was teaching her to brush her teeth. Well, thank you for that resource. I know we have um, just parents of all ages on this call, so I think that's super valuable. And then a lot of us also work with um, youth of all ages, so we really appreciate the information. Um, we do have another question, just um, asking for more information about how to do a church assessment. Um, so a church assessment probably is an entire another presentation, but the basic outline for it is in the book. But you start with uh, looking at what you're already doing. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, a church close to the border, border in Yuma, somebody had um, a home that they wanted to, and they had the skill set to um, staff the home. But the, the pastor thought, I think we better stop and think. And that's a biblical principle, count the cost. So she invited me to come and do a half day workshop with the folks in the church. And we thought, what a wonderful idea. How many can you house in a three bedroom, 1,250 square foot home? And they said six. I was like, well, you've got to have one room for your staff person. So yet yeah, that's not going to work. And um, you also, sometimes the girls can't be with another person because they might be a danger to themselves or others. So you might only have two girls that you could house. And by the way, the van that you use for sidewalk um, dance ministry in poor neighborhoods, you're gonna have to have that 24 seven based on child um, aftercare laws and uh, 
residential care requirements. So they began to see the real cost of opening a home was not viable, but they had to go through that process and understand. And then they began to see where particularly their outreach with the van in neighborhoods three night, three afternoons a week was making a huge difference in the quality of life for those kids. Um, some of those kids started coming to the youth group, um, got away from gangs and um, drugs. So Kim, what chapter is that in? I don't know what chapter it is. Oh, okay. Oh, I was thinking Kim, yeah. So, um, but um, yeah, I think it's in protection. Protection, okay, yeah. Chapter four, I believe that's. How to do that. I believe but, so. You know, the fence posts at the, at the end of one of the chapters includes, um, using learning how to use the ABCD model, the asset based community development model, identify the assets in your church, identify where unconnected assets in your church and community can be connected and identify the group or individual who has the capacity to initiate the greater connection. Um, On page 69, they talk about community assessment. That's in prevention and then okay. more of it anyway. And the six step assessment process is um, kind of bullet pointed on page 79. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. We are nearing the end of our time. So I just wanna say a warm thank you to Dr. Morgan and Kimberly for joining us today. We just really appreciate all the insights and um, I will just send a nudge to buy the book if you're able um, and I'll send the link back out and follow up to this meeting along with the recording. Um, but we have a longtime friend of the CJR um, and Churches Against Trafficking specifically, Ginger Shaw on this call, who's going to close us out with a prayer. Um, so I'm gonna pass it off to Ginger to close us out today. Thank you, Riley. And thank you, everybody, for being here. It really is um, uh, encouraging from when we started in 2012 to, uh, to see that we're still uh, engaging people of the church. But we have a lot of work to do. Yes. So let's go to the Lord because he's the master and he can figure out how to make this happen. Dear Lord God, we thank you so much for the people who are here for the call that you've put on their hearts and their minds to be a voice for the voiceless and to stand up for those who uh, need help uh, to secure justice and ensure justice in their life. Father God, we know that there is so much work to be done and we are so very grateful for each individual here who you have called because we know you have called your church to be a part of this fight we know that you have called this, your church, God, to be loving and caring and participating, protecting in partnership uh, as, we, as we build communities that not only prevent um, the vulnerable from being exploited, but also protect, support, and, and provide opportunities for those who have been exploited either through labor or sex trafficking. But God, we know that we need you to open our eyes. We need you to confirm our calling. We need you to convict our hearts of our areas of deficiency and the areas of where we have been neglectful. And we ask God that you confirm and renew our calling today. We ask that you would move us um, to a refreshment of our commitment to serve this community as you lead us. And we do ask, Lord God, that you lead us every single step of the way. Thank you for the expertise and the experience of Dr. Morgan and Kim and for how they've put that in a handbook to help us as we move our local churches. And we just ask God and we trust, ask and trust that you will make this um, a community that is moved um, by the people of faith, that, that the world will look around and see that the life of Christ that lives in us is the life of Christ that can offer new life 
to other people. In Christ's name we pray and to your glory. Amen. 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 Thank you Thanks so much, everybody. Everyone. We will see you in August for the stolen documentary, but thank you, Dr. Morgan and Kim for joining us today and for everyone else for your time. We'll see you soon. And so Great. encouraging. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.